This is my conversation with Steen Charmer from Warwick Manufacturing Group. Steen's a project engineer at WMG with focus on battery manufacturing. So I talked to him all about how the batteries are manufactured today, what the challenges are, and where the low-hanging fruit for innovation lie. This conversation is part of the Tech Deep Dive series that I'm doing on different emerging automotive technologies so we all have a good understanding, good nuanced understanding of where the technology is headed and where the innovations lie. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Steen, um, great to talk to you today. I'm glad you can join me in talking more about batteries and manufacturing. Um, you are uh, at the Warwick Manufacturing Group um, in the UK and for those of um, uh, those of us uh, and the listeners who don't know much about it, could you do? Uh, uh, could you tell me a little bit about the Warwick Manufacturing Group? Is it focused uh, purely on manufacturing of batteries, or does it cover a broad spectrum? No, that's a good question. So uh, the name probably uh, was born back in 1980, uh, and it was set. Uh, WMG is a faculty at the University of Warwick, uh, and it was set up by a fantastic guy, a guy called Lord Bhattacharya. Um, Indian national, came over to the UK, uh, and he did his PhD in the UK, uh, in the area of engineering. Uh, and through that, he saw an opportunity where uh, academics were brilliant at research, uh, and industrialists and OEMs were brilliant at making product. And there was this massive gap, you could call it communication gap, or an understanding gap. Uh, and he realized that actually, uh, this brilliance isn't actually filtering in so well into industry and industry isn't grabbing hold of the opportunity. So he set up, uh, he set up then uh, what is now called the Warwick Manufacturing Group. And uh, we do do an element, every element of manufacturing. It's, it's part of what we are. It's a part of our DNA. Yeah. Um, it sounds like it a very... Is, it sounds like a very commercial name, but it's actually a part of the university. Yeah, yeah, and that's what makes this unique. Um, so if you walk into the faculty, you'll meet people like me that come from industry uh, and you'll meet pure academics, uh, pure researchers. And it has that mix. I wouldn't say it's 50-50, but it's it's a, it's an healthy split. Um, so so yeah, so uh, that's, the, that's our unique USP, certainly in the UK. Got it. And that you, are you focused, um, purely on manufacturing or is there some fundamental science research also happening? So if you walk into WMG, uh, there's at least, I think it's about half a dozen buildings on site uh, and they're researching all sorts of different, different stuff. I reside in what's known as the Energy Innovation Center and that's a building purely focused on, on batteries uh, and, and electrification of products. Um, and that's what we focus on. But see, we come under the umbrella of WMG, but our, our team, if you will, of 300 engineers, scientists, is purely focused on uh, energy storage systems. Right. And power electronics as well, and yep. e-machines. Fantastic. So that's what I'm really looking forward to, is to talking to you more about uh, manufacturing and the challenges um, of batteries um, and, and all. Um, but maybe perhaps we can start off with sort of a 30,000 foot perspective and uh, talk about lithium ion batteries as they are today. Um, can you talk about how they are manufactured today? You don't have to get yeah. into like every single detail, but sort of a broad step-by-step uh, uh, -step process. No, I'll try, and, I'll try and do it justice. And it is a, a batteries are, are very much like Pandora's box. You open them up and you don't realize just how much you didn't know about batteries and, and uh, and how fascinating they are. Uh, and I've been involved with batteries now for about 10, 12 years. Uh, first got involved with batteries uh, many uh, those, those, that time ago. Uh, I was a CA engineer doing thermal, thermal modeling, uh, specifically on cars. And um, it just so happened that batteries came up on our radar. But in terms of how they're manufactured, we have a WMG uh, a facility called the Battery Scale Up Facility. Mm -hmm. It's a small mini plant and we, we, we mix and cut and assemble cells at the kilogram level. Uh, 
a good production run for us is 10 cells a day. Okay. <laughs> so we're, not, we're, we're far away from a gigawatt factory, as you can imagine. Um, but it's a fundamental part of the, of the DNA of battery development in the UK. It's a facility where researchers can uh, work at the active material level, uh, realize an active material level, uh, piece of uniqueness, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, and then scale that up such that it's a cell that you and I would understand and see uh, uh, and test uh, and understand how it may perform in the real world. Um, but we don't do scale up beyond beyond the kilogram level. We have a facility in the UK, which we supported, which is the UK BIC facility that was inaugurated, I think, last year. A very fresh new facility. Uh, and that works at the tonne level. Again, not a gigawatt uh, factory in any shape or form. Um, and so we start at the beginning and we help, we help industry understand what the scale up uh, requirements would be. Got it. Um, so from a, uh, but going back to uh, how uh, today's lithium ion batteries are, are manufactured, are you starting with, do you have a line um, at WMG that kind of mimics today's lithium ion chemical process, the, the yeah. making of, of, of that? Um, yeah. And then you're looking at innovations on that? Is that how that uh, works? Yeah. So we, 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 will, we will import uh, active materials just like a, a gigawatt factory would do. Uh, we go through, the chemists uh, will go through researching the, the mixing of those, of those active materials, either on the cathode side or on the anode side. Yeah. Uh, and that's dry mixing and wet mixing. Uh, and, and then that can be scaled, uh, scaled up uh, and put down our magtech line. It can be reel to reel coated, uh, patch coated um, on a on a reel to reel machine. Um, we make enough meterage to be able to assemble, assemble in any one shift. Like I say, up to about 10, 10 cells a day would be good for us. Um, but there'll be very, very unique uh, composition. Uh, so, um, so yeah, that's uh, so, so you, you've got a mixing part, uh, you've got a coating part, and we have a calandering part, uh, we have a slitting uh, part, and then we have a cell assembly area in a dry room where the cells would be would be assembled. So kind of a, a, a mini plant, if you will. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's unique in the UK uh, for, for, for academia, that's for sure. Um, is it uh, cylindrical or pouch, prismatic, all of the above? So all the mixing and the coating line is is agnostic to cell form form factor, uh, but we we can assemble twenty one seven hundreds. Uh, we can assemble pack Sorry, cells. I, I, could you elaborate on twenty one seven hundreds? Yes, it's a bit of a so uh, it's a cylindrical cell. Um, so is a commercial cell here. Uh, so twenty one millimeters diameter by seventy millimeters high. Uh, they call it 21700, so you have the extra zero uh, to define the form factor. Um, so if it was 2170 square, it'd be a square, square cell, not a round cell. So uh, that's the misnomer there. So, so yeah, so we, we, we can make, uh, assemble up to that form factor, and a lot of our partners are familiar with that, that form factor, and it's a good reference form factor. Um, in addition to that, we do pouch cells. Uh, sadly, I don't have an example with me. Sure. Uh, uh, pouch cell can be anything from a seven size up to whatever whatever size, um, uh, and up to a reasonable thickness, up to a reasonable a reasonable capacity of energy. Uh, we also can make and manufacture unique, weird, and wonderful stuff that other cell manufacturers just don't get involved in in their plants. So, if you want a particular shape. Uh, we have the in-house uh, capability and facilities yeah. to, to manufacture that. So from uh, today's manufacturing um, process perspective, where, where is the low hanging fruit um, in making the battery? You look at that and go, this is what we need to work on to either lower the cost or increase the energy density. So, so the low hanging fruit in, in the cell manufacturer probably doesn't exist itself. Uh, you know, we know where the costs could be could be gained. Um, so active materials are over around about 30 to 40 percent of the total cost of the cell. Um, you're building to your supply chain on getting that active material and getting that cost cost down or you increase the volume. It's that it's that simple, simple balance. Um, cell manufacturing and assembly itself is probably 
six to ten percent of the overall cost of the cell so yeah you can you can improve the manufacturing line but you're only kind of working in that in that sphere of six six to ten percent uh, so it's active materials are a, a key but if you step back uh, you and i know one single cell isn't going to satisfy your product's needs you're going to need a number of a number of cells in your in your product whether that's an e-bike or, or a car or an aircraft for that, for that matter you need to get to get the voltage up you need those those number of cells right so um that's probably where the low hanging fruit exists is by selecting the right form factor that your team can engineer into a pack and get into your product uh, and getting that tack time down uh, and, and getting the number the number down it's it's interesting when you look at the tesla s um, fantastic product brought the market uh, made everyone realize electric vehicles are real um it's just about 7,000 cells in that in that vehicle. And if you look at Model 3, that's come down. Uh, and if we look at the the larger cell size, the, um, the 48 from, from Nissan, uh, from, sorry, from, from Tesla, um, that will uh, that will reduce the cell count down from about 3,000 cells in the Model 3 down to about 500 or 600 cells. Yeah. So that, that's, the, see, that's the new cell that you're talking about, the 4680 or something that they've, that, that they've yeah. launched? Yeah, the uh, bait bean can. It's um, it's it's yeah, that's the cell I'm referring to. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so you can see, industry's not knows this. They're not they're wise to this, and uh, that's probably where the low hanging fruit is. Is is by thinking up, think looking upstream what your product needs are, and then yeah. feeding that back into your cell cell design, uh, and 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 doing what you do best if you make cylindrical cells well and you can do that at volume improve your cylindrical cell if you can make pouch cells at volume improve your pouch cell manufacturing capability but organize it such that you don't need a thousand of them in your car or your aircraft right um in uh, the tesla battery day the, the same thing we were just talking about They've talked about um, this dry manufacturing process where uh, and so instead of you know having this chemical, um, dissolving it into sulfuric acid, coating it, and then recovering all the liquids and all of that, they talked about just taking the powder and doing a dry coating um, up, up, uh, uh, straight um, on, onto the material. What are your thoughts on that? Is that... Um, do you look at that and go, wow, that's so clever and you're also working on it or is, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, first of all, first of all, it's clever. There's no doubt about it. Um, uh, but let's step back. If we look at how cells are currently manu currently manufactured, um, dry powder is taken in, either that because of the cathode or the, or the, or the anode, uh, the dry mix together already. Uh, and then certain binders, certain additives are added to that dry mix. Uh, and then, in current day, a solvent is 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 added to, to make a paste uh, right. or a black a black ink, mm -hmm. uh, if you will. And then that uh, is, it, is that the add. consistency? It's the consistency of a black ink. Yeah, or, it's pretty, or, or is it more of a paste? Um, I would say it's more of a paint. Uh, but you may have some instances where uh, a paste is uh, is equally is equally valid. Certainly, uh, the viscosity of the um, of the of the mix is is one measure, if you will, that this, uh, the chemists will make uh, okay. because that will impact the coating. Uh, and is, if anyone's had spent one of those weekends where they've had to paint the walls or paint the ceiling, um, if you've done it many times, you'll know when a good paint takes to a wall or doesn't, yeah. and the viscosity and the brushing and all that. So the coating process is a reel-to-reel -reel coating process. There's a, a slurry mix in a vat on one reel. Um, there's a slot die or a rotating slot die, uh, and, and that gets coated onto a metallic electrode, um, aluminium or, or, or copper. Um, for, the, for the picture so that I have in my on. mind is that of the um, automotive body paint, where you have this big tub of, of, of paint, um, and then you have uh, you have the, the the metal body of the of the car just dipped in, in there, and then you have. Um, you know, electrostatic coating on it, and then it comes off and it goes off onto drying. Is that is that kind of similar, or is it? Um, uh, it's it, it kind, of, kind of similar. Uh, if in the UK we we uh, 
when we do our Sunday dinner, uh, and, and maybe it's akin to Thanksgiving in the US when you roast your roast that roast your turkey, where some chefs use kitchen foil. It's very right. thin, metallic metallic metal that that comes on a reel, um, big big reel of a certain length. Uh, in our case, it's it's only about three or four hundred meters uh, width. Um, but in a, on a big plant, you'd expect that to be over a, over a couple of meters kind of length. Um, that comes in on a reel uh, and it's unreeled. And as it's unreeled through a machine, um, we have another reel uh, with a slurry mix, a tank, if you will, uh, with, with the ink being administrated to the top roll such that it prints onto the aluminium on one face. Um, in my in, in I've all your manufacturing like to do it on both faces as a reel to reel. You've got to get both sides of that that foil coated with a with an ink, uh, and that's kind of how it how it how it works current day. Right. So to double back to what uh, Tesla have done with their their dry process. Um, I mean they made the acquisition smart acquisition of Maxwell on their supercapacitors, uh, okay. and they brought that that IP with them, and it's smart move. So. Um, the way that they approach it, I understand, is rather than having a wet a wet mix, you have a dry mix, uh, which is already the process. You mix your N, your M, and your C into a mix that it is a binding element that helps all the conglomerates to stick to each other. Uh, and it just so happens in their dry mix, they bring a binder into play that allows them to take that dry mix, if you will, send it for a process, and rather than cut directly onto the electrode, they can make a reel of, of electrode. Uh, it, it has the same flexibility, it doesn't crack, it doesn't, it, it's very flexible, it's a dry, uh, a dry, a dry part. Uh, and then there's another process that will then impregnate that dry electrode onto the uh, current collector, onto the aluminium or copper, depending on whether you talk about the anode or the cathode. So they're doing away with the need to add the solvent. Uh, and the beauty about that is you don't need to remove the solvent afterwards. You put the solvent in with a current right. product, but you need to remove it after. And you need to collect that because it's not necessarily a, a particularly uh, nice material to, to expose to the environment. So uh, they sidestep that. Uh, it, it's neat. It's clever. Uh, but, I, you know, I'm not knocking it in any shape or form. But we have to recognise that you said earlier, what's the low hanging fruit? And tech. I think they're getting a saving on 10 within that 10 percent window uh, by adopting this dry dry mix but it's those incremental gains uh and if you're an athlete i'm not uh, in any shape or form it, right. it's all those incremental gains that add up to, to to the big to the bigger price so we'll see all sorts of i'll say weird but we'll see all literally dozens of these kind of novel techniques come to play uh and each one will have its part to play. And when you add them all up, you get that, you get that economic advantage. Yeah. Um, and uh, if I remember correctly, they talked about um, uh, the benefit being incremental for the battery, but also a big drop in the capital expenditure required to build batteries. So now you suddenly no longer need um, these large buildings to recover solvent and you know water waste and all of that um, yeah so so they'll get a benefit on the 17 percent of the overhead with regards to their to their manufacturing line as well uh, and that's not to be so um a lot of the pieces where people like to put battery factories certainly in the uk is on all disused airfields because uh, you get a nice long <laughs> a long uh, piece of green uh, well, uh, grey belt as we call it uh, where you can put your plant in and you can do this one continual process and a large percentage of that length of that factory will be associated with drying drying the electrode removing the solvent prior to rolling up the electrode to go on to the next phase which will be slitting canning uh, and, and formulation so uh, yeah, you you reduce the uh, your capital expenditure or your overhead, if you will, on your factory on that on that on that part for sure. Yeah, indeed. Um, talk about uh, battery chemistry. Um, so we are at a, it's it's lithium, um, and then it uses graphite today. Um, 
in the batteries. And there's a lot of discussion about increasing the amount of silicon in there where, where the, the holding lithium ion holding capacity goes up by quite a bit. Um, but then also you have um, the expansion because you know silicon expands quite a bit when, when it can hold like nine times more, but expands four times as much when it does. Um, what, um, what, what is WMG working on in terms of chemistry? Um, where do you see this going? I see different opinions from different experts. I'd love to hear what, um, what your personal thoughts are or what WMG is working on from a chemistry perspective. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, so we 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 start off from from what our partners' needs actually are. So, what it, what's the end customer's need? Uh, and the end customer is normally, in our opinion, is the is the, either the person that's driving the vehicle mm -hmm. uh, or the person that's manufacturing the the vehicle. Um, so, let's talk about cars first. That's something that I know a lot more than than, than I do anything else. Um, there's a power and energy. Uh, balance and if I walk outside um, and this is a Tesla S or a Tesla Model 3 there I'll expect it I'll expect it to, to deliver me a certain amount of range uh, but it doesn't need to deliver a high, high degree of power for it to give me the kind of driving experience that uh, would scare me uh, it, it, it's shocking or it's pleasantly shocking just how much power you can get out of a very modest battery uh, and electric electrical powertrain um, but there will be still a need where someone wants to take it further than that um, and, and and there's also products out there which won't just purely rely on battery energy storage um, we still have hybridized powertrains right in, in in the mix they'll be with us for at least for another five ten years and in the field for longer than this um, and in addition to that you had a talk of fuel cells uh, a fuel cell vehicle is a is an hybrid energy storage system. Uh, a fuel cell will still need a battery. Uh, it just so happens that a fuel cell won't need uh, a battery with a high degree of capacity. It'll need a, a battery that can give it power. Um, so, if I walked outside and there was a vehicle there from from whichever OEM which had a fuel cell in it, I'd expect that cell to be giving me power. Uh, and that's important to recognise because that does define, if you will, the tricks that you would play on the cathode and the tricks that you would play on the anode mm -hmm. and, and how you how you go for that low ending opportunity to get the price point right such that the customer will buy that buy that vehicle and in some cases um, cost is of no question you know you, you a person that buys a rolls royce is not interested in cost uh is interested in making or he or she is interested in making a statement it's a it's a purchase to represent who they are uh, so uh, an informed purchase a technological purchase a, a premium purchase so um it's important to know that when you start understanding the tricks you can play on the cathode and the tricks yeah. you can play on the anode so you talk about silicon going into the anode um yeah that's going to come uh, and i would expect to see that in 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 the kind of vehicle that I might purchase, uh, that, uh, whether that's the Model 3 or the Volkswagen ID3, uh, those kind of vehicles will have silicon come into play at some point. To just you mean affordable electric vehicles? Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It'll, be part of the, it'll be part of the mix that gets the cost the cost down because I I think on the cathode side, you're probably expecting the active materials to be around about 30, 30 to 40 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the anode, uh, on the anode side, it's 17, 17 percent, and silicon's that much cheaper than graphite. So uh, that's that sits in that category of low hanging fruit for you. So if you can deal with that that expansion uh, through clever processing, uh, uh, then you go for it. Uh, and it does come down to cell, uh, material selection. Does come down to hardcore chemistry, uh, insightful understandings. Um, that's not my area, that's that's definitely sits with the chemists. Uh, and, and how you process that, uh, you can gain some real big advantages by how you mix and how you cut uh, and in what you cut on. Uh, so yeah, I expect the silicon to come into play in the affordable area uh, products range. Okay, uh, so, so do you think some of the higher end vehicles like the Rolls Royce would not opt for a silicon based battery because there is a um, trade off? 
No, I think they'll be in there. Uh, but I think if if we I can't I can't say for Rolls Royce, uh, but I could see a, a situation where you have a, a high premium vehicle uh, where where we, we have a there's a racetrack uh, in Europe called the uh, Nürburgring. It's in okay. uh, yeah North Germany. Uh, I'm, and I'm aware. Yeah, good, good. Um, so there are people that will spend a small, a small, a small fortune on a car uh, with the intention that they will also try and kill themselves. But <laughs> come, 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 almost close. And, and to them, it's 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 crucial to have that one tenth of a second off their off their lap time, and they'll right. pay good money for it. So for that product, um, you may find. If you opened up the battery, uh, that you would find one cell format that gives him the capacity, uh, allows that driver to get to the track and allows you to get round the track a number of laps. But equally so, you might open it, the battery and also find alongside it a battery cell that doesn't have silicon in it. It has something else in it that, but gives him a significant amount of power for those one or two seconds where he wants or he or she wants to um, um, amuse themselves, and that's that's the uh, I think that's the balance really so so yeah you'll see silicon in play but it may not necessarily be in every single cell or in every product offering got it um what about um sulfur uh, or or some of the other metals that are coming in, into the um in, into the space so if we look on the cathode side uh, and we look at let's let's take nmc and let's take lfp the two two big uh, big players out there. Um, Sorry, what, what do they stand for? Oh, uh, are, the, are these companies or are these materials you're talking about? So you've got nickel, manganese and cobalt uh, and you've got lithium uh, phosphate as well, uh, iron phosphate, should I say. So they're both two fundamental different chemistries on the on the cathode, on the cathode side. Yeah. Um, iron phosphate, LFP, uh, without trying to pigeonhole it, it, it is down on, on, on capacity uh, compared to an NMC composition, uh, but it's brilliant for power uh, and it is very durable and it's just that much much cheaper. Uh, don't ask me how it's much cheaper, but it is, it is, it is cheaper right. uh, and it has a high durability. Um, NMC, uh, nickel, manganese and cobalt, um, you know, if we went back in time, the first offerings would be equal measures of those of those compositions, but cobalt is far more expensive than nickel, uh, and 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 you want to get that that down. So you've seen uh, steady progression for that ratio to go from six two two to eight one one, and it may be not far around the corner where there's no cobalt in in that in composition. So that's all about getting cost cost out of the uh, of, of the battery for for sure. Um, so, so yeah, it around the corner. I, I would say between now and 20, 2030, you, you're still going to see an NMC and certainly LFP in the in the mix. Whatever product offering you're looking you're looking at, an NCA will be in there as well, and maybe NCO and and, and other and other active materials on the cathode side. Um, uh, but uh, uh, sodium is cheap, uh, and there is active uh, research going on in that field. Um, you know, we reference cells back to the Ragoon chart. Uh, we have a good understanding of when I call the Ragoon chart, it has on the x-axis, it has the energy capacity, and on the y-axis, it has the power power capacity. And you can measure a cell on that on that simple simple graph. Um, and I would say for passenger car, if you're up to about 300 watt hours per kilogram, uh, it's done and dusted. You've got you've got a cell that will 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 meet the product proposition. It will meet the, the clients, the end customer's needs with regards to range. There'll always be that controversy in set, uh, of people out there that say, well, actually, I want to drive further than 300, 300 miles. I want, a, I want a 600 mile range car. But from the by and large of us, that's not what our requirements are. So uh, if you get up to around about 300 watt hours per kilogram, uh, that, that's a cell that's very appropriate for a 55, 60 kilowatt hour battery pack and it will suit your needs my needs the wife's needs anyone's normal commuting commuting needs and it'll suit our pocket as well big time um but when you start getting up to aircraft that needs to grow ultimately up to about 500 watt hours per kilogram uh we're just touching into it with with nmc and uh certainly not lfp 
but to double back, um, the lower cost chemistries, the, the, the round about the 100, 150 watt hours per kilogram, and that's in the lab, uh, not in any form of scale. And um, if I come back and look at what's happening in Europe, mm -hmm. um, there's a plan to have 20 to 26 factories built between now, well, they're, all, they're already planned for, but be, between now and 2030, uh, producing 600 gigawatt hours of batteries per annum. Per annum. Um, uh, to to keep put, up with the EV demand, is that primarily? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, at least six of those are all by one OEM based in, based in Germany, uh, and they can't meet the demand even with the six. They're having to buy stakes in, in other people uh, that are putting plants into, into place. Uh, uh, even though we've gone through this awful situation around the world, um, it's 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 caught everyone unawares that the sales in electric vehicles have, have, have gone beyond what the what what the expectation was. So we're underestimating the demand uh, for sure. Uh, and and the other, but the the flip of that, prices have come down as well. We we, if you will, we were pessimistic on the price point of batteries coming back is coming down so that coming down so my point is if you're planning 20 to 26 facilities in such a short period of time um the skill base the supply base is going to be focused on nmc it's going to be focused on the form factors we all know uh, and you just got to get it up to volume and you've got to get that that price down so um lower cost chemistries might come on the radar after 2030 uh um Hopefully we'll see the benefit of that as a consumer. It won't just turn out to be a profit for, for the OEMs. We will see uh, vehicles that give us those 300 miles uh, range to one charge that will be at a price point that we would never have expected it to have been at. Uh, and a vehicle that will, electric vehicles, they don't age the same as gasoline or diesel diesel engines. So um, I'm not saying you get to buy a car for life, but um, it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is it is fascinating. I I I, I completely believe that uh, because the the way the prices of computers have come down or even flat screen TVs have come down. I'm I'm old enough to remember um, when I first bought my flat screen TV, which actually wasn't that long ago, maybe yeah. 15 years ago. It was two thousand five hundred dollars, and it was a big plasma TV and. Um, Six years later, the next TV I think was 400. And um, last year I bought the same size TV for my basement for $200. Yeah. And that was yeah. um, a lot lighter, very low profile. Um, it's um, things have gotten ridiculously um, inexpensive. So I I would I would assume um, you know something similar for electric vehicles as well. I think I think so. Uh, and I, I, you know I. We hear the talk about people buying mobile phones uh, and, and turning those over every two or three year, two or three years, uh, and, and that's where consumers, consumers, and sporters with those particular products. But I, I think we have a more, we have a growing, informed, youthful, forward-looking, green, if you will, uh, mindset that's just slowly uh, coming coming to fruition. And um, I, I, I think you will have people that will buy a car. It'll suit their needs far longer than 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 if they'd have stuck with diesel or pet, uh, petrol. It'll, it'll run and run. Uh, they don't they don't age the same way. Batteries do. Uh, batteries do age. Um, but you know, we, we form emotional attachments with cars. Uh, maybe that's just me. Uh, we don't do that with phones or laptops. But with a car, for some reason, we do form that uh, that relationship. So yeah. yeah. So speaking of mobile phones, is the battery um, chemistry different because um, of the lack of any type of uh, cooling um, that can be available for for batteries and uh, for for laptops and mobile phone batteries? Yeah. So you, you, yeah. So if you looked at a mobile phone or a, a, a your laptop, it, it doesn't need uh, it doesn't need power. It just needs energy, uh, and the rate at which it discharges is milliamps, not not amps. Uh, so, it, it, its demands is completely is completely different. And you know, if we look at the e-bike growth, uh, what a fantastic product! Um, if you and I 
gone on our bicycles now uh, to get from one side of the town to the other side of the town we, we only need to generate 50 or 80 watts of power through our through our bodies to, to actually move that level of distance so um the power doesn't come into it with such a modest product such as the bicycle uh, uh but your car is different you know so it, it discharge it needs it, it's two and a half tons so yeah. uh, you need to move that mass before you move your own mass so um they discharge at a different rate so this the system requirements are different they, the thermal management needs are are different um it's a different 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 kettle of fish as we would call it yeah that's that, that's a very interesting point isn't it um with the car you're being really very inefficient if you think about it from a first principle perspective to move 80 kilograms of a person it has to move the 80 kilograms and um, two and a half tons, um, or probably a lot less for for the lighter cars. But you got to yeah. move all of that mass, and it uses all of the power, um, yeah. as opposed to um, uh, e-bikes, yeah. it, uh, motorcycles, or something. The, the 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 energy required to just move eighty kilograms. The closer you get to what you're trying to move, the less power or less energy you need. Yeah, and, you know, I I I I've reached that nice point in my career or my life where I can cycle to work um, and it's been a long time coming um, and I've been four miles from my workplace uh, I was recall the session where I was cycling to work and um, uh, and I could describe her, all I could describe her as is an, an old lady cycled past me and I thought well, blimey I my my somewhere else uh, and, and it took me a long time to catch her up uh, <laughs> at which point i realized that she was on an electrical bicycle uh, and i just thought that was brilliant you know we have people uh, possibly now deciding to go on smaller forms of transport because uh, it suits suits their lifestyle it suits their getting from a to b it, if I drive to work, uh, I spend more time looking <laughs> where to park my car uh, than it takes me to cycle to work, get off my bicycle and change and change into my work attire. So, um, yeah, if it, I think electrification, if it brings those uh, hybrid products to market that people make greener decisions, uh, well, that's good for the environment. Absolutely. And um, a, a good friend of mine, um, drives a um, electric bicycle, not drives, rides an electric <laughs> bicycle to work. And his reasoning was that he did not want to show up sweaty to his morning meetings. So yeah. when he's biking, if there's an up, he uses the electric boost all through a small section of uphill that there is on the way to work, but the rest, you know, um, and he arrives just as, just as fresh, he says. Yeah, one of, one of the limit, limiting factors for me was um, I, I've got young children. So between me and my wife, we'll, we'll organise through the week who picks up, who drops off, you know, that old that old game. And um, if I'm picking up or dropping off, I, I'm fortunate that I can just still do that on my bicycle. But uh, when my daughter sat on the back of the bike, it, it's just a bit harder to pedal. And that's when I think maybe an electrical bicycle would work for me uh, and then you start thinking hold on maybe, maybe there's a gap between the electrical bicycle and the car maybe it's not just me that's limited by choosing a certain type of daily commute uh, based on based on what i need so you know it, it electrification of products is opening up those kind of product offerings where people go yeah i will buy that that, that bicycle i will cycle to work and it fits my life and i'm i think it's brilliant yeah indeed um, supercharging, so that's uh, or rapid charging. That's one of the uh, key enabling technologies we believe that's going to make electric vehicles more uh, attractive and viable for a broader group of people, um, so that they can go long distances and the range anxiety um, is, is reduced. What are the limiting factors today um, in being able to just charge a significant amount of uh, uh, battery in let's say 15 20 minutes yeah so i would say there's a number of forces at play here uh, and, and some forces are working against us on this one uh, and i'll come back to that one but if i could say the chemistry and the composition of the cell uh, the chemistry limits uh, the rate at which it can be charged uh, but i would say it's not as easy to compare one nmc with 
another chemistry with another chemistry. There are lim there are some clear uh, distinctive operation points between those, but there's also um, differences in how you manufacture that cell and how you build that build that cell, uh, which will realise different different charging capabilities. Um, so one, uh, one NMC cell from one manufacturer will not work the same as another manufacturer. They all have different unique points. And in fact, if you went into a cell manufacturer and said, look, the, the USP for my product is fast charging, uh, they could engineer you a cell to meet, to meet that need in a, certain, in a certain bandwidth. How, um, how, how much different could it be um, from one, one uh, type of a cell to another in terms of fast charging capacity? 10, 20 percent, or are we talking bigger than that, 50 plus? Uh, it's, it's how you're going to measure that. So I don't think you're ever going to get to a point where, say, you pull up in your Model 3 and you put it on fast charge and you're going to get yourself a coffee uh, and your colleague turns up in a Volkswagen and he puts their car on fast charge and, and, and you're stood by the curbside waiting for your car still to charge. It, it, you're not going, I don't think you're going to see that all those kind of things will be understood by the, the battery uh, engineer uh, and scientists and they'll engineer around around that where it might limit them is if mm -hmm. you again was to open up the battery you may say oh yours has got a really interesting thermal management system on that on that product uh, and really big <laughs> really big uh, prismatic cells, uh, whereas mine's got a very modest uh, thermal management system and, and that much smaller cells, but a lot more of them, um, and it may be thermally managed in a different in a different way. So, form factor comes into play, and the way that you thermally manage that that cell and that module and that, that pack impact uh, your your charging time. Um, I will double back on that and say that there might be an aging aspect, mm -hmm. uh, different uh, one cell may age more than the other. Um, but we go through a process, a rigorous process of cell selection. Uh, and that's a, a series of tests that we would do to understand how that cell would work. And then we engineer around its strengths and its weaknesses uh, such that the end customer would know none the better uh, as to whether they felt they had a great cell or a bad cell, I would argue 90% of people don't care what cells in their car as long as it meets that budget, it can fast charge. Uh, and That's it, me. Yeah, yeah, and it's me as well. Uh, well, actually, no, I quite like to see what's in the cell. And I'm sure you, 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 the technocrat will definitely want to know that. So uh, I don't think you'll measure, you see those differences, um, but it may just be that the engineers have had to work that much harder to make one cell chemistry work better or equally as much as the other one. And if I could put a figure around it, uh, if, Again, if I look at, say, the uh, typical Tesla Model 3 or a Volkswagen ID3, if you, was to, you and I was to drive that, even if we was to go on the freeway uh, and, and, and go fast with heavy, heavy load, for a period of time, we may reject a level of heat around about the 6 to 10 kilowatt level. So um, I didn't realise this, but in the UK, we drink a lot of tea. It's our stereotype, right? And we have... Right. Uh, we have an electric kettle. Um, apparently, in the US, you have you more inclined to using the stove. You put the kettle on the stove and boil right. it off the stove. Uh, but a kettle uh, in the UK uh, would boil a litre of water in and around two minutes or there and thereabouts, and, and consume around about 100 watts uh, of power uh, to, 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 to raise that temperature up to 100 degrees Celsius. So we always refer back to how much energy or power a kettle because uh, it's very tangible. Um, so you, it's the equivalent of boiling six liters of water in two minutes. If you if you get my, if you get my drink. that's a lot. That's quite a few cups of tea. That, uh, not even I could drink that much. So that's the, that's the driving energy power, or that's the heat rejection. That's the, the yeah, that's the heat rejection. Uh, so a rule of thumb, even 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 with the most efficient cell and for the most efficient thermal management system, you're probably talking about 5% uh, of the overall energy that you're using to drive that vehicle up the freeway uh, is, is being lost to heat uh, associated with your battery. That's related to the age of the battery as well. As well. So a fresh new battery doesn't uh, rejects that less heat 
compared to an older battery. In fact, batteries are very much like human beings. I, uh, I sweat a lot more than I used to if I was cycling my bicycle. Uh, so I generate more heat than I used to. So, um, so driving a vehicle, thermal energy, I would say is relatively straightforward. Uh, meeting the thermal management needs during the fast charge period is, uh, is, a, is another step change. So if it's six kilowatts for driving an ID3 down the freeway, um, by the time you come to the uh, your electrical charging station and you go and get your Costa coffee or your uh, Starbucks while you put it on fast charge, uh, you're needing to reject something like 25 kilowatts of heat. Um, that's and that car's not moving, so there's yeah. no airflow through the cooling cooling pack. Uh, it won't be constant. Uh, so there are strategies that OEMs are playing, and very cleverly so to manage that scenario. And I think intelligence will come into play on that in terms of how you precondition your battery prior to a, a charging event it may well be that your char your battery knows how many times you, a week you stop for a starbucks to go for a to go for a costa or, or a starbucks so it'll have that level of intelligence and it will put a, a, a preconditioning scenario into place to to meet your fast charging needs yeah so it's five percent of the power that's coming in or out of the battery, right? So if you're driving, it's around five percent that needs to be done. But if you're parked and you're charging, it's still about five percent because that's the energy moving through the battery. So if you are going to be fast charging and let's say doing, I don't know, three hundred kilowatts, then you have five percent. Yeah. So the power the power demand is just just that much harder during the charge. And uh, I would, you know, we we talk about resistance and we talk about impedance uh moving the lithium ions during a discharge event is not the same as moving them during a charge charge event so the efficiency is not quite quite the set it's not it's not the same right um so you generally will find that it's, it's just that much harder uh to get energy into your cell if you look at a cell specification sheet uh, widely available on the on the internet you will notice that more cells will discharge at a higher rate then they will charge at, uh, and that because the uh, chemistry involved and the, and the impedance difference between charging and dis and discharging, um, uh, and we talk about C rec. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so I would say uh, a C rec is a is a, just a simple reference that represents back to the capacity of the cell, the rate of energy that you're taking out of it. So, for a four amp hour cell. Uh, if I said I was discharging it at one C, you would only be taking out four amps uh, at that period. Um, so driving a car, you're probably talking anything maximum for uh, an ID three a six C discharge discharge rate. Mm -hmm. um, you'd probably be lucky if you could do that for a charge event. And in fact, if you came to me. Said, I'm charging at 4.5 C at the cell at the cell level. Uh, that, that's some going. <laughs> right. So you, you can't you can't charge at the same rate as you can discharge at. Um, so you've got that to play with as well. And what I find fascinating is is that um, if cell numbers are going down, uh, so you've seen Tesla, uh, you know, if they're going down from 8,000 cells to 4,000 cells to say 600 cells, uh, then <laughs> that means you've got a larger form factor cell in there. Uh, and how do you integrate that with your thermal management system? It's, cells generate the heat right in the center of the, of the cell. Uh, and you've got to get that heat out. And that's a challenge for all thermal engineers. So the, la the larger the batteries you make it, you make give, making it harder for thermal management yeah. because um, now you have a larger gradient from the center to the to the yeah. outer part of the yeah cell. yeah exactly so you know if you're if you're talking about some of these cell to cell to pack concepts mm -hmm. uh, um we're, we're, we're talking prismatic cells up to about 200 amp hours uh, and to put that into context that cylindrical cell that i held up earlier is is only four amp hours um but the ratio between uh, the volume to surface has mm -hmm. got worse as it is so um and when you when you look inside the cell regardless of it being a, a cylindrical cell or a prismatic cell or a pouch cell inside it's uh, either a, a stack of electrodes with a 
polymer separator between them right. or winding of electrodes. Uh, so polymer is one of the worst materials for uh, for for heat transfer. So everything works works against you, but we'll crack it. People will crack it. Um, but what will be interesting, I think, is that when we do start looking at those larger form form factor cells, is is there'll be that much more intelligence and know how about how that cell generates heat throughout its lifespan. Uh, you'll know how to measure it, uh, and there'll be a, a response delay. Uh, always is depending on where you put your thermistor or your thermocouple, but you'll know that response, so you'll know how to react to it. Uh, so your BMS system, your battery management system. We'll have that level of intelligence to be able to manage manage that and, and dare i say it, maybe we're not far away from seeing cells with instrumentation in, employed inside the cell uh, rather than just module level to be able to control that yeah absolutely and one of the conversations that i had with um anna talked about how instrumentation inside the cell looking at just the pressure of the cell and its expansion can tell us a lot about age and other things about the battery as well yeah I, I mean i'm lucky in the sense that in the same office as me there are uh battery scientists and chemists that have been working on batteries for for decades uh and we, <laughs> they can do some some very clever tests uh and it, I mean, it's a bit like reading tea leaves to me uh they can deduce so much intelligence from how that cell operates uh, because they've been there seen that um and, and add that that experience and that that's that's key to to understanding what what you're seeing from the results and there's different tests and different diagnostics that you can do uh, and having a good well-served electrochemist in your team uh, that has that experience uh, is a is a fantastic asset to have yeah indeed so uh steen let me ask you about the the future of batteries if i were to time travel go to 2030 maybe pick a VW or a, a, a popular uh, electric vehicle, take the battery and cut it open. What, what is your bet on and what I will see and what does the battery look like? So I, I, I still think it'll be a liquid electrolyte cell. Uh, I think the cathode will differ. Will differ. Uh, I don't think you'll see cobalt in there. You might see uh, a pure metallic element on the anode side. Uh, you might see a large percentage of, of uh, silicon in there. I mean, 2030 isn't that far, far away, far away. Uh, and I think, but if I was to double, double back, um, I think I worked it out. If, if you, it, I think you need, uh, you need something like 7,000 employees in the plant alone for one gigawatt factory. Um, and that's only producing, say, up to say 40 gigawatt hour, you know, uh, of capacity a year. Um, and I think we need 600 of that to meet to meet demand. So um, I, I think we're going to end up with far more people informed about batteries and how to make them than, mm -hmm. than anyway. It's such, such a fascinating opportunity for the employment of high skilled jobs throughout throughout the world uh, to meet that to meet that. So I think in 2030, I still think you'll see liquid electrolyte in there, uh, in that kind of product, uh, in the ID3 or the Tesla Model 3. I think you'll see less number of cells. Um, I think you might see a move away from liquid cooling plates. Uh, I think you might see two phase systems coming into play. Um, but I think liquid, uh, liquid cooling will still be there in the, in the lower end. Mm -hmm. um, it, it may be, uh, say, in the premium vehicle offerings where people are prepared to pay that much more money, uh, solid state will creep in. Um, I know it's been talked about and so people promise it and it never it never delivers. But I'm testing solid state battery cells now in, in the lab and they're of a reasonable capacity and they perform at a reasonable, a reasonable level. Um, uh, so I think they'll be coming to the premium in the premium sector. That manufacturing challenge of making a solid state battery shouldn't be underestimated, certainly at volume. So it may not be until 2040 or 2045 that we'll ever see that technology. And I'll be shot out of court possibly by several people on this one. So probably should be careful, but I think that's probably uh, the reality of the situation. The, the, the term also reminds me of um, the regular 
hard drives versus solid state hard drives where um, the premium laptops these days have the solid state hard drive, but still yeah. the bread and butter, the majority of the laptops are still 7,200 or 7,400 RPM magnetic yeah. yes, hard drives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I come back to the point, if you if you buy a Model 3, uh, depending on what finance deal you bought it on and how you, I mean, if it, if it still delivers the goods and your servicing costs are still manageable, what's the motivation for going to the next model, model three, if it meets your needs? So, um, and that will help in, in many ways because I don't think we can make enough batteries quickly enough such that everyone can have a brand new um, electric vehicle every three, for every three years. Uh, that's a huge edit for the OEMs on how you stay uh, commercially viable during, during the, next, the next era, if you will. Cool. Steen, thank you very much for talking with me today about batteries and manufacturing. I enjoyed the conversation very much. And you, thanks for your, thanks for your time, Sadie. Hope we meet again soon. Thank you.